What's up guys, this is Sean Daisy from Be Real TV. I'm here with John the Deuce of Corn, and I'm here with Eddie Media from Suicide Silence. Guys, thank you for taking time out from your busy schedules and doing this great interview. Oh, good. Pleasure. So uh, first off, currently you guys are on Corn's self-titled tour of Celebration of their 20th album. How does it feel, Eddie, how does it feel your band is being on the tour of the band that has giving you a lot of inspiration. You know, um, yeah, Eddie, how is that? How is that, you know? It's, uh, it's one of the most exhilarating things I've ever experienced in my life. Um, you know, there's this, uh, there's this 13 year old kid sitting inside of me that whenever we go on stage, just is having the time of his fucking life. And uh, it's, it's one of the best feelings on earth. Um, it was an honor just even being uh, mentioned for this tour and then on top of that actually getting the offer it was like everything was super crazy during that time too I mean I, I told you what the other stuff that happened at right like literally day after so um, yeah man it was it's, it's, it's for all of us too I, I, I see it on on everybody when we're on stage nobody has to say anything they just look at me and you just see everybody's 13 year old self just kind of having the time of our lives you know? John, how do you what would you feel about that? That you're having a band like Suicide Silence only it's, for you? It's it's just retarded. It's, it, it, I don't I can only grip that. I just remember being like when we first started opening up for bands and like you open up for Ozzy, yeah. for Metallica. Those those were the minds. I'm like Ugh. I remember Hetfield or Ozzy still this day when he comes in. What come in my dressing, Jonathan? Or Hetfield, what's up, JD? I'm like. That was my name. <laughs> Ozzy was trying to say hi to me. It's just surreal. Yeah. So it's kind of weird being in that. They've been here for 20 years and now there's youngsters coming up. And it's that for them, it's just a, you know, it comes full circle. So it's a trip for me. But I, I, I understand how you feel because I did that with, with my heroes. Um, sure. Myself. So I, I can't imagine that, you know, somebody, somebody like Hetfield just knowing your name. Somebody yeah. like just be coming into your room, into your space, hang out with you. That's, it's, it's insane. Like, like for me watching Fieldy, like I, I was a big fan of bass players when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. So for me watching Fieldy, like kind of like pace our room to be like, hey guys, come come hang out for a second. It's like, what, dude? Like, is this my life? Is yes, this bro. Real? I know the feelings. So, uh, yeah, it's insane for sure. <laughs> you know, uh, a couple a couple of uh, a couple two three days ago, we were uh, at catering, and you were like you you were mentioning your family. And, um, for me, that's always something that strikes a, a bell for me because my family is super important to me. Um, I brought my, my parents around and whatnot. You know, one of the hardest things of being a touring musician is you know staying in touch and you know being fully there while being fully present here on the road. Um, so for me, I just I'm a, I've always been curious how a person of your stature, of, of your accomplishments, has maintained your your connection with your family, your love with your family, your you know, the love with your wife, all these things, it's just like, what what gets you through, what helps you maintain it? Uh, um, it's, dude, it's, it's tough, it's, it's, you gotta figure it out, you gotta find first the right person. Um, they can deal with your shit, being gone all the time. Um, you gotta just figure out ways to keep in touch with your kids, if you have kids or whatever family, it's just a balancing act. For them, my family knows. For me, for Daddy to be alive, he has to play music. Yeah. Pretty much, that's it. That's the, the balance, and they understand that, and my wife understands that, and we figured it out. Because I'm I'm back in the I'm old school tour musician. We didn't have FaceTime. We didn't have that stuff. So it was it was going to a truck stop and, and getting a roll of quarters and putting them in the payphone. And that's the way I talked to um, my wife and I talked to my kid. I mean, I remember leaving. I had, when Nathan was born, at that time, I was there, he was born. The next morning, I had to go do Loveline. So, he didn't, I didn't get to go home with him. Um, and then the next day I left for Europe, and I didn't see him until he was four months old. Um, it's just the sacrifice you have to make so that they have a better, you know, a, a better life. And now, it's, and you would you gotta just have a down ass bitch, man. Yeah, dude, really. <laughs> it's all down to that. Yeah. My, my old lady, I've been with my old lady 17 years. I love her to death. She helps take care of my, she does an amazing job taking care of my kids and keeping shit together. Cause when I'm out here working, I mean, it's, it's hard. 
but you just gotta do this balancing act and it's a lot of FaceTiming now and just finding the right person that can understand it because to be honest, yeah. my mom, my dad, my dad was a touring musician. My mom left my dad when three, they got to work because she couldn't take him being gone. So from an early age, I knew that shit was gonna happen. I mean, you just gotta find the right person because most girls can't take that. Yeah, I agree. So you just gotta just... That's the one thing I've encountered is just I can't find somebody who's down. <laughs> Yeah, man, it's, it's, it's tough. It's a lonely life. And then when you got it, you're here and you're by yourself. You just hang out with a bunch of dudes and it smells and you don't I get to take showers that. and <laughs> play sweaty ass clubs, but you gotta be in it and love, wanna love yeah. it. There's there's no other feeling for me. But going out go. on stage, that's that's why I'm single. That's why I, you know, I choose this over being yeah, with man. anybody else, which is why that's that question aroused. I mean, it was like aroused, it was like, it's, I wanted to know, you know, what, like, how people do it, because I don't get to talk to too many people that, that do this as a full career, you guys tour a shit ton. And, ton, bro. And that's, that's something that, you know, as a fan, you take into consideration, you're like, dang, this guy's really giving everything. That's giving everything. I miss so. watching my boys grow up. Jonathan, do you have a question for Eddie? Let me see. I don't know. Um, it's gonna be, I don't know, one of the weirdest, like, what is it like coming out to this band, stepping in the shoes, um, you know, this what happened with Mitch and everything, what, how does that affect you mentally, how does it affect everything within the band, um, that's, you got some big shoes to fill, brother, how did yeah. that, how did that, uh, come about, what was, what went on? So, um, I did my first national tour with Suicide Song. They, did, they were the headliners. My, my band, All Shall Perish, was direct support. Mm -hmm. And um, before that, we were, before being set for that, I had met Mitch, and I remember just being like, dude, how do you do this with your vocals? And we just sat and nerded out for a while. Mm -hmm. And like, I remember since that moment, it's just been like a constant back and forth of influence between him and I. And uh, he was definitely the, the number one guy that I looked, like, looked, looked up to in our scene, in, yeah. our, in our world. So. He was my boy, we talked all the time. And then um, when these guys asked me to join, it was it was highly stressful, man. I remember I broke out. I'd got my, my, my arm tattooed, and we were sitting there, and I was reading comments like I should do on the internet. Oh, God. Yeah, and I, uh, I broke out. And the hives? Super, super crazy hives, and I couldn't realize, I couldn't figure out what the hell I was doing. I was um, working out with Garza and like starting to get into that world. Garza's really healthy, like he became really healthy after Mitch passed away. And like everybody had this different air to them, like this, uh, this this energy of like, hey man, we're not here to take this for granted, so you better be coming correct or you're not coming at all. Yeah. And that, that puts this huge pressure that nobody else in this world, no Twitter comment, nobody on Instagram, nobody on Facebook, nobody on YouTube is ever gonna amount to the amount of pressure that you're getting from the guys that you're trying to help out. Yeah. The guys that you're trying to push forward uh, in their career, in their path, in their legacy. You know? So for me, it was really, really stressful, really, really nerve wracking. Um, so many nights of sitting there like, asking myself this is something that I can do, am I strong enough, and, you know, am I big enough for this, you know, I I was always, you know, the people that knew me always compared me to me, so they were like, dude, this guy goes hard, man, you, like, what are you doing, well, you, need to, you need to go as hard as him, blah, blah, and friendly competition, yeah, you know, and that's how it always is, but then, like, you know, coming into it, the, the biggest thing was that I had confidence, as much as there was pressure coming from the band, there was a lot of confidence coming from the band, they chose me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, there's nobody else to fill these shoes. Like, we we have our we have our, our pick if we wanted to. But yeah. you're the you're the first round draft pick. That's how Dan Kenny says it. Wow. He goes, you're the first round draft pick, and we know you're gonna kill it. And being being doing Soundwave with you guys, that that for me was like a big thing. It was like, all right, we're going out there like Alice in Chains, the Testament, our boys from the Bay. You know, we got corn out there. It's like it's almost like we got the Dylan Hughes tape on board, the Mass Song guys. It's like all these bands that I look up to that were gonna be there for my first show, Phil and the Illegals, you know what I mean? All these all these big bands that I, I like adore and they're there for my first experience with this <laughs> insane task that I was given. Yeah, dude. But I I do <laughs> funny story. Right before we went on stage, Alex's triggers completely went out. We're like five minutes before we hit the stage. My first show. <laughs> in Brisbane, dude. Yeah. And I was like, oh, what is about to happen? And sure enough, the Thyroid is murder guys landed to something. We went on stage and we killed it. And it's 
been history ever since, man. Every day is every day is a challenge to get better, and that's that. Man. So, um, speaking of Mitch Lugger, um, I remember Suicide Silence they collaborated with Corn on their last album, The Black Crown, for a song called Witness and Addiction. Mm -hmm. How do you feel like that? Do you feel that was kind of the first planting seed of the Corn Suicide Silence kind of tree um, connection that it, that? No, I mean, I first time was the first at the first uh, Volver Awards when I first saw him, and that's when I talked. I was like, "Dude, that's heavy shit." And that's when I first met. Uh, it was Alex Hamditch. I first talked to him then, and then I just knew they were big fans of the band. And when I saw him, went around with it whenever I remember. Um, they just came out and saw me, and I saw him. We hung out, so I took that picture with him, and that was before that. I think that was. I mean, my brain. I'm sorry. Twenty years of banging my head. Right <laughs> My memories can be kind of off, but um, then uh, I got the call asking if they wanted to do it. Well, hell yeah, I love that band. It was, it was cool. Um, so we did it up, and then uh, and I got the news that that happened. It was unfortunate. It was, it was, it was a sad day, for sure. I remember, I remember my first experience with Garza. I'm, I'm sorry, like I say Garza because when I first started seeing the band every day. He's the guy that I like. I knew he was the guy biting the wrist. You know, the guy kind of pushing the band behind Mitch. Uh -huh. And um, there's a there's a song that they have that's like really close to the, uh, the, the ball playing intro. And for me, I was always like, they're a death metal band. Like most death metal bands don't like give it up to new metal at all or give it up to any kind of exploration of music. So. For me, I was always like that. I was always in tune to the fact that they were big Horn fans, and they were like Garza's. Garza adores Monkey. You know what I mean? Like he like he thinks, you know, that is like where music is, and you know the, the pain that goes into the music from that aspect. He really tunes into that. He really respects that. So, I mean, from Suicide Sons side, it's it started from a long time ago. You know what I mean? When, well, this guy is young. Yeah, we were the, like old we're those kids waiting at the issues to a right at the front, you know what I mean? <laughs> fans that are just so into their scene and just cut everything out. Yeah. Yeah, you can do more open-minded. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Okay, final question is actually directed to both of you. Okay. So, with the tour wrapping up soon, what do you guys take from this? On both camps, Jonathan from, you know, in the corn world, Eddie and Suicide Silence, what do you guys will take from I'm sad, man. <laughs> I, know, I'm, I'm, I know the sadness, bro. I know that so well. I remember so many tours went on. It was just so fun, and then when it ends, it sucks. It really sucks. I'm sorry. Well, it's just like your guys' crowds. Like your guys' boy. crowds are so so awesome to us. So it's just like it's a pleasure to go out there every day to see guys in the back that are my age that were repping corn their whole lives that have never dropped the ball, never given up never done anything but be good fans and they're like I would be standing right next to them coming to the show if I was at home you know and and it's like I'm I'm getting to play it and it's like like you said it's such a surreal experience and it's like it's crazy man. not only that but your guys' crew has been so so kind to us well, we, learned, we learned very early on how not to be into a band because of our first tour and um, we got treated really shitty and we always we swear to god if we ever got big enough to where we can line we take care of our opening events and so we've always been something we've always wanted to do. Yeah, we're, we're very grateful, man. So, okay. yeah, so th thanks, and uh, yeah, that, that sadness is the one feeling I'm feeling right now, but other than that, it's I'm just... Sad. I'm happy as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I'm so motherfucking happy I don't got to play this fucking album again after this tour. <laughs> I'm going to be straight up honest. I don't like fucking playing that fucking record. It's dark. It fucks with my head. I've gotten into the worst depression on this tour. It's just some shit that needs to go to bed. I'm glad I did it, and the only reason I did it was for the fans so they could come out and, and feel that and see that. Don't and ask ain't, again, and right? don't ask fucking don't again. Don't ask I'm not gonna again, do it again, dude. <laughs> I'm not going to do it again. Too old for this shit. Get too old for this shit. <laughs> Throw up the lethal weapon right there, and we'll get it, all right? <laughs> well, guys, I want to say thank you for taking your time out of your schedule to do this interview with Melissa for Real TV. And um, it's a wrap, guys. Thanks, be real. Thanks, man.